Yep, just did. Go ahead. All right. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to some of our India colleagues. Um, today we have uh, four speakers that are tag teaming to talk about a Pacific Northwest regional study on generation options for reliability and resiliency. Um, the bios were provided, so I'm not going to take time to talk about that. Um, if you have questions, you you can uh, reach out to all of us afterwards. Um, this is a joint collaboration between Pacific Northwest National Labs, PNNL, and WSU as part of the Advanced Grid Institute. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bose to get us started, and then um, we will have uh, Jeff Daigle from PNNL, Sanjeev Panala, Anjan Bose, and Noel Schultz from WSU. So, Dr. Bose. Okay, <clears throat> let's. Uh move to the first slide. Um, I it. So it's changing. Can you see the change? Uh, one? No, I don't see anything right now. It's not moving. Yeah, it's not moving. Here it's moving. So I can, I can completely move the screen. Yes, it's here. Sorry. How about now? Oh. I just see a black screen. Black screen? Yes. Oh. Are you logged into the meeting? Are yes, you? I'm into the meeting. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Jeff, can you see it? Are you seeing a black screen? Black screen. Actually, oh. I can do it again, but yeah, I don't know what's, what's going on. I'm just sharing it, presenting it. Can you see now? Nope, it's still a black screen. Wow. You're not seeing it here either. So no, we're no. not seeing it here either. Can you just share? Is it in the presentation mode? Yes. Everything. So can you share the whole, like whole screen of? Whole it laptop. Working till now. It was just working. It was just working. I didn't even move the slide. <laughs> it went black now. But maybe I can rejoin it for the time being. Just a moment, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just rejoin it. The meeting. About now, something. Oops. Oh, we're not seeing it here, so they can't possibly see it. I don't know. Sanjeev, yeah. did you change it, or is it still the same as yesterday? Yeah, I changed a little bit. I can, I can just send it over. Sorry, I just, I'm just sending it now. Can you share it? Yeah, I can share it if you send it to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sending it now. Right away. Sent. It's a big file. It'll take a yeah. Take a so, Amjan, why don't you just start with his general comments while we're while we're waiting for this? Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to say very much uh, today. It's mainly about the um, about the study of Washington State uh, and the future of what's happening in Washington state. But this was motivated by um, the National Academy study that came out last year about the future of the grid in the uh, future of electricity in the US. And uh, so I, I think you may remember some of you, uh, we, we made presentations on that as well at the time. And uh, so that prompted us uh, uh, the four of us to look at what is the grid going to look like at, in Washington state. And uh, so that's, uh, um, that, 
that's what we've been looking at. And it started out first by looking at the data from Washington State. What is the generation mix in Washington State? And, uh, and what has been the trend over the last few years? Okay, and as you will see, um, and, and you already know, that uh, the Northwest here, not just Washington, but also uh, Idaho and uh, Oregon and so on, are very much uh, um, supplied by hydropower. So we're about 65% uh, clean hydropower to start with. That's where most, most of our energy comes with. Comes, uh, and, and that's a big advantage because we're already ahead of the game in terms of having clean energy, uh, meaning in, in many parts uh, of, this, of the US, the average in the US is actually more like 60, 65% of fossil, either coal or, or, or gas, right? So there we are. So then the question is, what is it going to look like? We still have quite a bit of gas and we're putting in wind in a very, uh, up in Washington state, wind is coming in pretty quickly. And uh, um, so so that's, that's where our situation is. And uh, uh, when the slide comes up, you'll see that the, the state of Washington has passed several laws which says that we will, um, by 2030, or I think it's 2035, we're going to be out of 2030. There will no longer be any coal. Actually, it's going to be faster than that. It's going to be like 20, 2025 when we will have no more coal. But um, uh, the idea is by 2045, we will be completely carbon neutral. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so that's the... Um, uh, that's the main uh, goal from the Washington State point of view. So, the, so what we started doing was that uh, we started looking at uh, um, what has been the trend for the last few years in Washington State. And, uh, and basically, there's only one coal plant in Washington state in, uh, okay, there we go, there we go. Um, so that was the uh, motivation, as we said, the future of electric power in the United States. This came out last, last year in 2021. And uh, um, so then uh, the, the main thing was then each region of the US See, it's going to it has a different mixture of generation, right? And uh, so we are probably the most uh, uh, clean in the sense that we get most of our power from water. And uh, um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so this is the Washington State uh, plans for what, and these are these refer these numbers and letters refer to bills that have been passed by the state. And which says by 2025, all our coal fire resources are going to be done. And actually the, the amount of coal fire resources we have in the state itself, there's only, um, only one power plant in Centralia, which is just south of Seattle. And uh, um, and that's already sh shut down or, or shutting down very carefully. But there, were, but both uh, uh, Puget Sound Energy and Avista had partial ownership of a generating plant in Montana called Coal Strip. It's a big, huge coal plant, and so they would import their portion of that plant and. So this, uh, this law actually says that we won't do that anymore after 2025. Okay, so basically we'll, we're not going to not, not, need, not generate coal power, but we will not import coal power either. Okay, so that's, uh, um, and then by 2030, uh, it says that electric supply must be greenhouse gas neutral. And I don't know if you know what that means, but 
it means that you, we, we're going to be left with some amount of natural gas uh, generation. And by 2030, the idea is to some be, become neutral. That is, if even if we don't uh, completely eliminate natural gas generation, that we will be able to either uh, do make it neutral. That is, there won't be any. We are not going to be producing more carbon. And the way you can get neutral, one way is to, of course, just uh, take the carbon dioxide and, and put it and store it and not let it go into the environment. So that's that's one way to go neutral. The other way is to try and buy, if there's a carbon uh, uh, carbon market, which we don't have, then you can you can buy, you can pay into the carbon market. And, and the, basically, if somebody is carbon negative, then they can actually make money by selling their carbon negative. Uh, so, so those of us that are that are carbon positive could probably buy into that. So that's another way. And another way, are there are other many kinds of things that that come into play. You can plant a lot of trees that uh, that uh, that uh, absorb carbon dioxide and so on. But by 2045, the Thing is uh, electric supply must be 100% renewable or, or generated from zero carbon. So basically what they're saying is by 2045, there's not going to be any gas. And, and that's going to be a hard one to, to reach as you'll see from, our, from, the, from the studies we've done. Um, and there, there is a whole bunch of other kind of policies that the state has already adopted. Um, one uh, is on electric vehicles to try and get uh, uh, the penetration of electric vehicles up. But the other one, which is actually was going to impact a lot of people, uh, is uh, that they want to they they want the buildings to become all electric. So they're not going to allow um, commercial buildings and industrial buildings to have natural gas going into there for heating, cooling. Uh, for uh, for cooking, whatever, the, and th and that's going to start either next year or the year after. Sorry, 2024 is what they're saying is going to do that. This just passed last month um, about the buildings, and then they are uh, over time. I think a few years later, no new residential buildings will be allowed to have natural gas, which is a big big change because most of most of us are used to cooking with natural gas and, and heating. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, what's the next one, uh, Noel? I think I'm probably done here. Yeah. 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 Um, so so this, is, this is starting to look at the Washington state. And I think Jeff, Jeff or, or is it Noel, you? I'm doing, I'm doing this one. So you can hear me OK? Yep. Yeah, so we're, we're in three different places. So. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do was um, look at the findings from our Washington uh, State Electric Utilities, and they put together integrated resource plans, or IRPs, and some of the issues and challenges that were identified along that um, come into play related to some of our, our generation for reliability and resiliency. So first of all, water availability, availability and variability has had drastic impacts on energy production um, and, and operations of utilities. We're seeing that really the, the spring and summer hydro production is very dependent on our adequate snowpack. And as we see some of the temperatures rising with climate change, some things that should be snow might be rain. So they're, they're happening in say uh, March or April then, then they're not available as snowpack to melt and then be part of hydro later in the summer. And so we also have uh, the different levels that we might have of hydro and that impacts and you'll see some of that as we talk about some of the graphs. Um, some of the other resource deficits are looking at the loss of a coal generation that uh, Dr. Bose talked about and then also some of the expiring hydro contracts. And as we look at some of the changes there, how that's going to impact uh, the particular cases. Uh, wind generation uh, integration um, has a transmission limit. And um, quite often right now, storage is not really 
economically viable. So uh, as we look at, and we'll talk about this and as we get into some of the next steps, uh, limited energy storage is currently deployed to, to support the grid. There really, we really don't have uh, an extensive storage plan across um, the state and across really uh, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, most of our storage right now is in water uh, related to dams. Um, as we look at opportunities for renewable developers, a lot of the prime sites are in central and eastern Washington, but the challenge is uh, some of those transmission corridors will have congestion as we add more and more renewables um, in this part of the state. Um, we also are seeing that uh, many of the utilities are putting out RFPs or requests for proposals related to getting green generation um, as they work on getting green credits. Um, and so these utilities are putting out those calls to get more information. Um, as as uh, Dr. Bose mentioned earlier, the additional net zero requirements will be met through some of these renewable credits or green power purchases, because quite often the utilities don't necessarily have the green energy themselves, but they're purchasing it from a, another party. Um, you know, the big unknown is electric vehicles in the adoption of electric vehicles, but also how do we create a charging infrastructure um, as uh, that relates to that? And I've had several of our WSU um, alums ask me how we're going to charge all the, the Cougar Teslas or other electric vehicles after a football game when we have, uh, say, 20,000 electric vehicles in Pullman, and how do we deal with that? And then the short term capacity peak demands um, quite often, um, as Dr. Bose mentioned, we are going to have to look at natural gas for some of our short term de demands um, because we may not be able to get that from the energy imbalance market. The other big activity that has come up uh, more recently, and we hear a lot about it from DOE, but is energy equity. How do we make sure that some of these green energy opportunities are across all socioeconomic ranges and as well as um, in, in different uh, working with tribal groups and other groups um, so that we have equity across the board, not just for certain income levels. So um, the next uh, thing, as we look at the utility action plans, um, there's a lot of significant investment in renewable resources. Obviously, that's something that's being talked about. There's also talk about energy conservation. How do we and when we really look at when we look at the equation of generation um, equaling load plus any losses, in addition to additional generation, we can also look at how do we adjust the load. We're not going to talk a lot about that today. That's another part of the equation. But um, looking at energy conservation and demand response, um, you know, some of the different creative avenues are, are looking at um, different data centers and how they might provide demand response or energy conservation, as well as other resources. We also are looking at the integration of resources, um, including uh, residential solar and battery batteries in different locations and how that can help with some of our resiliency, particularly in the distribution system. Um, long duration storage, you know, when we start talking about battery storage, typically those are for shorter durations. So how do we deal with longer durations um, as part of like Sonomish PUD um, recently had windstorms that some of the houses were out, uh, they had 50% of their customers that were out originally. How do we have long term where it was almost a week for some of their resources to uh, some of their customers to get back on? Also trying to have a reduced uh, reliance on short term market purchases um, that because of the costs related to that. How can we have a longer term strategy? And then also looking at alternative fuels to operate new generating plants. There's been a lot of talk about hydrogen recently across the board, but what are some alternative fuels or even uh, natural gas that may be uh, 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 renewable natural gas uh, type of generated? And then the renewable credits that we talked about previously. So next I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Daigle to talk about um, some of the different numbers and, and things uh, and graphs. So Jeff. Great, thank you, Noel. Uh, along with Dr. Schulz, I'm the co-director of the Advanced Grid Institute from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. 
Normally I'd be in Richmond, Washington, but today I'm at a resilience meeting in Seattle, so it's uh, snowing outside, so I hope I make it home tonight. Um, as, as both Dr. Bose and Dr. Schultz talked about, uh, Washington State is, is really kind of in a unique position uh, as we lead the country in terms of adopting a, a carbon-free electric power grid. Uh, and what we wanted to do with this study that Dr. Panala is going to talk about here in a minute is really dig into what would it take to replace uh, the coal that we currently have uh, with wind? Uh, just a, a fuel switch from coal to wind. And, and you'll kind of see by the end of this uh, talk that there's some real significant challenges there. But before we get into those uh, details, I just want to uh, uh, dig through a little bit of background about the state of Washington. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Panala for putting this uh, material together. And he derived this information from the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, Energy Information Administration. They put out a lot of good data. Um, and so you can get state level data uh, by generation type, a um, lot of information that you can sift through if you're not familiar with the EIA. And this chart here shows the load in uh, Washington State and by month, and then each bar is a, is a year. And so you can see there is some variation from year to year, you know, when we have a heat wave or or, or significantly below average um, cold weather in the winter, or above average weather in the summer, you can get um, load that's that's either above or below average there. Uh, but it, it typically is, is pretty consistent from month to month, but clearly a winter peaking region here um, in terms of our electricity demand. And so that's uh, um, you know pretty significant. It's split evenly between residential, commercial, industrial. Uh, that aspect is similar to other states, but this winter peaking aspect is, is unique to northern uh, states. So if you compare data to California or other places, they would be summer peaking in those regions. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, and then you know the last comment, there's uh, transportation load currently is very, very, very small. But as as Dr. Bose talked about with the electric vehicles, both Dr. Bose, and Dr. Schultz talked about electric vehicles, uh, that fraction is going to rise significantly. Uh, coal today is pretty small uh, fraction of the total, uh, but if you look at these charts, um, we show both coal and wind, um, and and so they're they're you know, modest uh, fraction of the total. It's it's not nearly as much as the hydro, uh, but you can see that there's um, uh, more variation in terms of the output. Now, one of the reasons why coal is low in April and May and in, in those months is that's when we have a lot of hydro available. As the snow is melting, we have what's, what's called spring runoff. There's a lot of hydropower available in the system. And so coal isn't dispatched during those times. It's a flexible resource. It's um, it, it's it's turned on when it's needed, um, turned off when it's not needed. So you can see it's producing a lot more energy during the winter months, much less in the spring. And that's really because of the availability of the hydro. Um, wind, on the other hand, is not dispatched. And so you capture the wind energy uh, when you want it or, or when it's available, not necessarily when you want it. And so right away, there's a there's a issue here of uh, seeing a lot of wind available in the spring months, and that may not necessarily match very well with the with the hydro. And these are just monthly totals when you you'll, you'll see later in the presentation that Dr. Panala will show uh, when you look at the hourly variations, it gets much more significant uh, where you can have a, a few days at a time without any wind generation at all. But just even at the monthly averages, you can see significant variations and much more variations between the, the years as well. A lot of that, however, is um, with the um, adoption of more and more wind, we see more wind available in more recent years. If we go to the next slide. And then um, hydro. Um, so the scale on this is significantly more on the previous slide. So this is about uh, 10 times um, magnified on the scale. And so you can see the definitely the spring runoff is is characteristic there. Uh, much less uh, hydro is available in the in the fall and, and going into the winter. Um, and so there is kind of a mismatch between when the the peak demand is and when the hydro availability is. And so that's that is a significant thing. The other thing to note from this is there's a lot of variation from year to year in terms of the amount of hydro that's available, and that has to do with the amount of snow that we get not only here in in Washington, 
but also up in Canada because, uh, you know, the Columbia River comes down from Canada. And so the snowpack in the in the Pacific Northwest, including Canada, is a huge factor in terms of how much uh, power is going to be available from the hydro system. So you'll see a lot more variation from one year to the next. Um, and, and that's really made up uh, today with natural gas. If you go to the next slide. And so natural gas um, provides that firming capacity uh, when the hydro is less available, uh, we'll need to rely more on the natural gas. And um, so this is, this, as Dr. Bose alluded to earlier, this is going to be a lot more significant to, to think about how do we operate the power grid without any natural gas generation. Um, so we're going to definitely need to think about that. As engineers, we're all going to have to really think hard about what we're going to need to do with the natural gas. Um, coal replacement, at least here in Washington, is much more straightforward because we have uh, such a limited amount of coal that we currently use for power generation. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So all of the previous charts were uh, energy. And so energy, we measure that in megawatt hours. And so we we're showing monthly totals of energy. Uh, but what we wanted to also show in this slide is the um, megawatts or the power output uh, available from these, these resources. And there could be a significant difference between the, the power output uh, capacity and the amount of energy that you can get from it, particularly with things like um, you know, wind and, and, and to some extent solar. The uh, amount of resource available from that name capacity obviously isn't, isn't available when the wind's not blowing or the sun isn't shining. But it also applies to things like hydro when the, the availability of the water, um, you know, you look at the capacity factor associated with uh, uh, so they're not 100% either. Um, the, the coal could be, uh, um, you know, dispatched nuclear is usually they'll have outages, but other than that, they run baseload or 100%. And so you look at the differences between where we get our energy from. So, for example, you know, focus in on the on the coal. Um, it's 4% of nameplate power capacity, but it's significantly more percent of energy, 6%. So, so it's much more of a, of a needed resource. Hydro is pretty much, um, you know, dominant in both cases, but we have more power available than energy. Uh, gas is, is dispatch as needed. Nuclear is significantly more on the energy than the power because it runs pretty much 100% um, uh, of the time, except for when it's in an outage. And so that's the differences that you'll see there. But the key takeaway here is that coal today is a fairly modest amount by both power and energy. It's less than 10% in both categories. And, um, um, you know, so replacing coal in this region should be a relatively straightforward thing. But what you're going to see is that doing a direct correlation between replacing coal with wind is going to be a, it would represent a significant challenge if you just try to do a straight out fuel swap. Uh, keep in mind that when they retire the Centralia coal plant, they're going to accommodate that with gas and and other resources. It won't just be a straight fuel swap from from you know building wind turbines to replace that coal output. So what we're going to show you here in the next series of slides is 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 not a representation of what will really happen in the future, but it's really an engineering assessment of of that comparison of if we replace coal with gas or wind, if we replace the coal with the wind, what would that look like and what would the storage requirements be? So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Panala to uh, take us to the next part of the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. So like uh, Dr. Schultz and uh, Dr. Bose uh, discussed, so here is the uh, the key takeaway from the, the study, like uh, what Jeff mentioned. So we are going to focus on, on the vein replacement, on, uh, sorry, coal replacement with the vein only. And then we're also adding the energy storage just to make it as a firm uh, generation, like because the coal was a firm generation, we can easily dispatch whenever we need it, but it is the, not the way uh, we can get it from the vein. So, so here, so the like we mentioned is the percentages wise, the capacity is still the energy is 6.7 in a total uh, generation. So if you look at it, the, the availability side, so the state, 
can only get major contribution from the wind if you just look at the renewable energy resources. And right now, the wind stands at like 383 megawatt capacity, but uh, production-wise still it is within the less than the 10% of the energy generation. It's not even close to the 10%. So, so here, even here, we are, why we did why did we consider the wind because it is already contributing highest, and we can leverage the more uh, wind plants by adding them. And then, what is the the variation look like? Because the variation, if you look at the data-wise, just keeping the two different locations from the state. So the state, if you look at the the one location, the eastern side or the other uh, Cascadia, so the variability actually captured in the capacity factor. So that means it's the generation over a month. So if I just take the uh, generation over a month and hourly, and then if I compute the, what is the capacity production based on the maximum capacity available. So it is coming around like 0.22 or 0.4, but for just one month, looking at the two different locations, it was what not equal. So that means that indicates we can't really correlate one location or the two different locations within the same state with the same capacity. So you will get one location higher amount and the other location you can't really get the same amount of the generation. So that's why you can't really relate an average capacity factor for a wind in a complete state. And that is not even true for the, the country wise. So if they assume the planners, the 0.35 as a capacity factor for a wind, that's not true because it all depends on the location and geography. And again, it also have the other way impact, like uh, what is the weather and then uh, the variability in the weather also impact these uh, uh, the generation uh, out of the wind. So, but if you look at the coal side, it's steady and you're actually supporting in terms of the v, uh, winter peak. But then when the extreme hot and cold weather happens, so then you won't, really get much energy produced from the wind side. That is the other disorder we have it from the wind. So, so how do we really make it a steady generation? So that's why we consider the wind plus the storage, but in order to replace the 6.7% of energy, so how, how the numbers look like. So that's what I'm going to cover and the, what is the variability we consider. So before I jump into the, uh, uh, the study, so next slide. So there are particular assumptions we made it, the first assumption is actually like uh, the megawatt capacity we treated equal to the what the coal uh, capacity was. It's like 1,459 megawatt of power capacity is equal to the, the best, the battery energy storage system. And the energy we are not equating because we don't know the what is the amount of backup energy we needed to make it a steady generation from the, the storage side. And then the what are the generation that we are getting the load and the generation data from EA is precisely re represent the complete state level scenario. And we are not, um, and the, the, what are the, the data we pull it from the EA represent the geographic boundaries. Like it only represents the resources within the Washington state. If something is lying outside the state, we are not capturing because the data only considers the, the boundary uh, on the, the resources located within the boundaries of the state. And the maximum hourly generation, so like we mentioned, it's it's only the month-wise. So what are the monthly-wise, the maximum generation we are capturing for a particular wind plan? So we are treating that as a plant capacity because we didn't get the exact data from that particular plant. So we are assuming that what are the max, you will get it in a year that will be like a, the plant capacity of that uh, wind plant. And then here again, so it will be like a, the losses wise, we didn't even consider the wind losses and we consider the efficiency of the battery energy storage system as 80%, that is the typical, it's a round trip efficiency, how much the conversion loss takes from the charging to the discharging. So it's a round trip to be considered as 80%. And the two different utilities data was pulled uh, from the EIA. So it is actually complete 2019 year data. We gather, it's hourly data, it's an hourly production. And then we uh, did it for the state level because we just pulled the data for the, the utility and then we normalized and we extrapolated to the state level capacities. So now, uh, next slide. So now if you look at the variability, how does the really impact the variability from the wind side? If you just look at the two different utility wind plants, you see the, the, the capacity factor. That means the variability you see from the same month of January and December, it is almost double. So that means two different locations can give you more flexibility. But if you put all of them at one place, then you're not going to get the diversity in the generation. So either you end up getting the congestion in generation or the load congestion, in those lines. So the diversity really make a good uh, proposition for the replacement side, 
But again, so we don't know what are the best settings or the uh, sites for these location. It all again depends where you're locating it. So we need to consider the complete uh, diverse location within each state. And, but if you look at the other months, still you see the some variability, uh, like February through the November, but the December and January, you see the wide variation between two different locations. Uh, next slide. So based on that, what is the amount of the capacity is needed? Because we need to determine, uh, looking at the actual historical data set, what is the produced from the wind plants, by looking at that and extrapolating to the state level, we need to understand what is the capacity look like, the power capacity look like for the complete state level uh, replacement. So that's only 1,459 megawatt replacement of the coal we are targeting now here. So if you consider, if I consider the, if we consider the January month, like the 0.2 and 0.4 capacity factors, so one of the factors will give you the like almost the 2,200 megawatt of the capacity. If I just, the, Consider the other way around, like it will give you the the 4,000 plus. So that's almost the double the capacity you needed for the same month, just to replace the same monthly production from the coal side. So that is the capacity. But if you look at the the December month, the December was the worst month, and that you need to replace the huge amount of the coal generation because the coal was supporting the winter peak periods. That's where you need the most power from the wind. So that's why we are. That getting the high number of the capacity, that's a 7,802 7, megawatt needed in the December month. So again, it doesn't even guarantee it. Right now we're only determining the wind capacities. We are not even looking at the, the study generation. It can be varying every time. You can't get the study generation like a coal. So we are going to add the storage along with this capacity. That means the capacity right now, what we have in the state is 3,000. We need to make the more than the double the capacity plus the storage then only you can able to replace that 6.7% energy. So next slide. So here, the, this one, uh, the talks about the variability, like I, I discussed, like how the variability looks like. If I just wanted to see the mismatch between the coal and the wind for the state level data, so we see, you can easily observe here for uh, two years, the 2019 and 2020, so the mismatch is right fluctuating and this very different. But if you go to the next slide, so there is no direct correlation between one year to the other year. You can see the, the mismatch is much higher in 2020 compared to the 2019. So it all depends on weather. You can't really relate or correlate with respect to historical data set saying, okay, the last year was good and then I can easily uh, get the same amount of energy needed or the backup needed for the next year. It varies a lot from year to year. So you can't really, estimate the next year wind profile or the wind variation, how it could be look like just looking at like past few years, but you can able to guess it, but so that's a still a challenging uh, problem. So that's why we are going for the, the storage uh, capacity. The uh, next slide. Yeah, so here the, what are the major objections just looking at the variability of the wind. So the average, like the monthly wind capacity factors indirectly represent the availability or the generation from the wind plants is like coming around 0.33 if I look at the complete year, but actually the looking, looking at the different IRPs or the utilities, what they consider for the planning side, they only consider the 0.35. That's an again, annual average. If you look at the monthly average, that's even worse. The monthly averages are like touching even low as like 0.2 and going higher like 0.44. So, but that's not even close. So that's where like the, the monthly and the daily variation, if you look at it, so that's it's really random because if you look at the daily average wind hours, like zero wind hours, you don't get any kind of wind availability. That's four hours continuously won't get it. That's an average in a monthly. So that means I average the complete month and estimating what is the daily average zero hours. But if you look at it, the continuous wind zero hours, that will be approximately 2.5 days in a month the complete year of 2019 data. That was actual data-based uh, uh, statistics. It's not like we are estimating it, the historical data-based uh, uh, computation. So, and if we consider very low wind periods, it's a, country, a continuously three days, you won't get any wind at all in that particular month. So it means the three days, you won't have any wind. So you need to completely rely on the battery storage system. And then that, how you, what is the amount it could look like? So go to the next slide. So if I just compute it for the month of January, so I just for, for example, so the 
if we look at the two different wind capacity based factors so one ex one of the case study will give you 4200 megawatt uh, megawatt wind capacity but it requires 3600 megawatt of battery energy storage system again it's just the monthly basis we are determining we are not even including the complete uh, um, um, the uh, default scenarios or the worst scenarios in it so here we are just looking at the january month and the next, the, the worst month is actually the December. So the worst month will give you the highest capacity of the wind. And then it will also give you the, the, the energy storage. That's the energy storage is less because you are increasing your wind capacity. And then you're able to restore it with respect to the lessening the, lessening the uh, uh, battery energy storage capacity. That's like 110 thousands of megawatt energy storage. So that what it concludes is if you can increase the wind capacity, then you can certainly decrease the storage capacity needed or the energy capacity is needed. But it again, there are a lot of things we didn't even uh, uh, consider well in here because the one is the efficiency wise we consider, but we didn't even consider what is the charge and discharge look like, what are the cycles, how many times you are going to use it and how big is your storage use should be and whether it can really replicate all the scenario, operational scenarios from the demand side flexibility or not. Those are still in, in didn't even go through in this case study. Uh, next slide. So here, if you just look at the two months, I'm, I'm replacing the uh, January month with the two different uh, capacity factor, taking the worst capacity factor and the best capacity factor, or maybe the, that particular capacity factor. So you see the variability on the left-hand side of the uh, figure, the generation scenario and the variability. On the right-hand side, on the top, you see the just looking at the same capacity factor for that particular month, not even looking at the worst capacity factor in the year. So then you need the 4,200 megawatt of in a, uh, uh, for a wind plant capacity, you need the 3,600, uh, 360,000 megawatt hour energy. So that is again, you're continuously discharging it. You're not even locating, looking at like charging and discharging it. It just simply charged once you're assuming we are assuming that it's charged once and it is readily available and you're continuously discharging in that case you were able to fulfill the study generation like coal in that month but if we look at the higher capacity higher power capacity from the wind plant then you can see the reduction in the storage because you have enough flexibility to charge it back or you have the the to supplement it with the actual generation from the wind uh, next slide so then this will be like uh, for the, the three months, the January and May and the December, because these are the typical uh, uh, months that we consider for the different seasons. And so here the Jan and December will give you the winter peak periods and the May will be a spring where we have a runoff uh, river and the spill, uh, spill, uh, spill over of the hydros. So that's where we get a higher amount of the hydros. So even in those cases, still need the good amount of the energy storage capacity so the all these ones look at it like how do we really conclude it okay what is the energy capacity is needed from the wind side to make the wind as a steady generation um, next slide so again here we didn't even consider the uh, the cycles charging and discharge cycle so we are assuming that everything is available 100 percent beginning of that month and then we can able to discharge completely what if if we consider like a weekly cycles okay but if you just take the the worst days like we mentioned 2.5 to 3 days was the non available wind uh, non available wind hours so that will be if you just look at the coal capacity 1460 megawatt is the power capacity and then if you consider like 2.5 days of non availability of uh, wind then if you make it 24 hours so that will be like eight uh, eight say 87600 uh, megawatt hour energy needed for a backup for just three days okay and that kind of worst scenarios will decide the what is the storage capacity needed for that particular month so whenever you have like more non-available wind periods so that will decide the the backup needed the energy capacity needed from the storage side in that particular month and then again if you have enough uh, production from wind so you don't really need that much backup and because you have a much uh, flexibility getting the generation like if you're lucky but again it depends on the weather so here, the rest of the months, and the, the, there is no direct coincidence between the, the wind days from one year to other year, or even not in one month to another month. So you can't really conclude based on one of the data sets. But it is, again, sensitive to the complete weather profile. Next slide. 
Yeah, so here we looked at the cutoff simulations. Like what if we consider the cutoff simulation saying, okay, we charge uh, for a, we charge after a week discharge. Like if we consider like week, weekly interval. So can I make that happen? I mean, we're again assuming it at the end of that week, we are able to get the 100% charge back. We are not even sure like how we are charging it, but what we assume is we are assuming that the charging could be done from the vent. So that means you need to double the capacity of the vent where you're replacing it so that you can charge the energy. I mean, you can charge the batteries from the same vent instead of going or relaying on the other resources. That is again a burden to the existing resources. Instead of acting as a source, you're making it as a load then. So that's why, so we consider the weekly cutoff simulation, will that help? So that will reduce us the, uh, drastically reduce the energy capacity needed. So you can look at the 80,000 megawatt hour needed instead of like a 110,000 megawatt hour. So if you can make it like a charging and discharging cycle much flexible, and if you have enough energy uh, capacity from the storage side, you can still able to survive. But again, it depends on how many days you're losing or maybe how many days you're not getting the wind profile if you don't have other fixed resources. So that is the major uh, conclusion from this. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I think I'll hand over to the Jeff. We'll, we'll conclude overall summary. Great, thanks Great. Sanjeev. Um, so as you can see with just <clears throat> a modest amount of generation, uh, going from something that's dispatchable like coal to something that's not dispatchable like wind and trying to make those equivalent and taking into account that the wind may not be um, available, you know, requires a significant amount of storage. And, and Sanjeev walked through the, the methodology that you can use to calculate um, that storage. And it's a significant amount, you know, 250,000 megawatt hours in this case um, would be extremely expensive to, to build something like that. And so clearly that's that's not a viable option. And so there's going to be other ways that we're going to accommodate the retirement of these coal plants. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind that what makes this complicated is that the, the capacity factors uh, vary dramatically based on the weather. And and it's it's very unfortunate, but there's also a very strong correlation between when the wind is blowing or, or maybe more precisely when it's not blowing and and the extreme temperatures that we have. Um, you know, it's particularly in our region here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, a low wind event corresponds to a, a weather pattern uh, that's a stationary high pressure front. And that weather system corresponds to our coldest cold days and our hottest high days in the year. And that is exactly the time when the wind is not blowing. So there's some really big challenges here. So you can look at average capacity factors for the month, but you know it really takes looking at these, these um, hourly uh, data that we have but also looking at how that's going to correspond with the with the needs on the system. Uh, we do believe that storage is an important part of the of the puzzle and and studies like this and the methodologies that uh, Dr. Panala walked through is a way to estimate the storage requirements. But long duration energy storage and low cost long duration energy storage is going to be uh, really, really important. And it's going to be more important during these extreme weather events. And so uh, you know, as, as a good researcher always does, we say that there's more uh, research that's needed, uh, but clearly these are big challenges and we are just scratching the surface here with thinking about how we're going to get rid of um, coal out of our resource mix. It's going to be uh, significantly more difficult when we think about what are we going to do when we don't have the availability of our natural gas resource. So uh, that's a quick uh, summary of what we had prepared and uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Sanjeev, Noel, and Anjan to, to uh, join me in uh, answering questions that we have. Okay, question, go ahead. Okay, so um, Professor Bose already discussed that in some cases, the boundaries of the state and the electrical boundaries of the system do not match. I mean, some part of that electrical system could be in another state. So in that case, what kind of legislation is going to be applicable on that part of the system? Yeah, because that's a different targets. And let's suppose Idaho has different targets. So how do you deal with that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when you look at the power grid, you know, there's different layers, right? And we're all familiar with transmission and, and distribution are kind of different components of the power grid. Um, and so when you look at, at distribution and what utilities are legislated to do through the, the public utility commissions and things like that, the states have a pretty big influence in terms of uh, mandating these requirements to, to the utilities that operate in those states through those uh, state uh, sanctioned regulatory authority. And so if they tell the, the Washington state based utilities that they can't uh, emit anything, then they have to come up with a solution to to have non emitting resources. But, you know, as we all know, the power grid, you know, here in the Western interconnection, it spans 14 states and two provinces of Canada, and a little part of Mexico. That's one big system. And the electrons don't know what these uh, state boundaries are. They're just flying around in this big system. And so so it does make this these analysis more complicated, but there's also some good aspects of it. Sanjeev found that the uh, if you look at the these diversity of the wind resources and you get bigger and bigger areas that you can consider um, when it's not blowing in one area, it might be blowing in another area. And so transmission can really help to solve some of these issues. If we build more transmission to tap into some of these remote resources that can go a long ways towards solving some of these challenges. And so um but to your point it, it makes it more complicated because there's things happening at the state level there's other things happening you know kind of in the interstate area and and we kind of keep all those things um in 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 sight for the purposes of this of this study we just focused in on washington state and and so it's not a it's not a, a realistic from the sense of of how people are really going to solve these problems because it could be far cheaper to build a transmission line to tap into some remote wind rather than to build a gigantic uh, energy storage facility to try to levelize out the wind, right? So those are some examples of things that utility planners will, will be clever about doing. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, you know, some of these issues we've brought up um, have been highlighted in a recent DOE um, funding opportunities announcement. Um, I dropped, dropped it in the chat, but it's called GRIP, G-R-I-P, it's Grid Resilience Innovation Partnership Programs, and they're dealing with the transmission and, and distribution uh, places where there's challenges getting energy from one place to the other, as well as some other renewable energy, um, and, and we can send that information out as well. So some of these things we're talking about, we're actually seeing uh, DOE putting information out. Jim Hanna, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, fantastic presentation, everyone. It's great data and, and fantastic research. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to layer on at a next iteration of the study, distributed generation models. Um, I know that at Microsoft, in Wyoming at least, and other areas we're exploring using our data center backup generation capacity as a, as a distributed generation tool for peak shaving and the like. And obviously, with the advent of more and more electric vehicles, you know, we have an opportunity to use them as distributed generation. Yeah, and, you know, certainly not to the scale that we're talking about here, but every little bit counts. Uh, yeah, no, uh, Jim, thanks for the question. And, and I, I agree. I think those types of resources are going to be extremely helpful. Um, you know, and, and again, that uh using uh, uh distributed generation to kind of meet the resilience requirements um is a little bit out of scope of what we're looking at for this particular study but for i sure. totally agree with you that it's a it's a resource that's extremely valuable and and would uh you know would would definitely fit in terms of the future uh one of the things that will will be a little challenging is dealing with in, in washington state and the and the um legislative goals that the that the state passed you know trying to get to a, a completely carbon free grid by 2045, you know, we'll have to look at what is the fuel of those uh, distributed generators that, that you're talking about. And so are we going to have um, things that are carbon free that we can we can tap into that, that are also dispatchable and and whether that's, you know, um, biofuel of some sort or maybe hydrogen or some other thing, right? Uh, we'll have to look at that, you know, or it could be where we're, we're pairing long duration storage with these things that we've been talking about. But but for sure, I, I'm a big believer in, in leveraging or harnessing the distributed generators to, to feed into the, the overall system objectives. Thank you.
Yeah, Jim, I think you that's the other part of the equation I was talking a little bit about. Um, the first phase, what we wanted to look at was as we take coal out, what are what is our normal generation mix and how does that come? But as you're as you mentioned, the distributed generation, also controllable loads, um, you know, the ability to um, that we have there, there's lots of different on the other side of the equation, and that's something we want to start working with um, in our next next phase of some of the activities is to look at how would that be part of it. Um, but this was just the first phase of looking at at our generation and how much how much energy we're going to need to replace that coal. Yeah, this is fantastic foundational research for uh, providing solutions in the next phase. Thank you. We have some questions here because. Yeah, Dr. Bush, you touched a little bit about carbon trading. Is it similar to what they do in car companies? Like many sport car companies, they don't meet the emission criteria and they pay electric car companies a lot of money and then they, I don't know, somehow combinedly, they are in, on average, they don't produce that much. Well, the, that's the idea I hadn't heard about car companies. Yeah, that's what they do because most of the like sport car big companies are they can't not, manage not the that. criteria. But the carbon trading is uh, uh, basically uh, the same idea is the same that people can exchange there. Somebody has got too much. Did we lose the conference term? I don't know. Anjan, Anjan was mid sentence when you got cut off. Yeah, I, I can still hear you, so. Let me text and tell them. So Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about small nuclear reactors? While I'm texting them. There's a question yeah. in the chat about any sure. talk regarding yeah. small nuclear reactors, Jeff? Yeah, there's there's a lot of interest in that. Again, that's a little bit outside the scope of our of our study, but but for sure that's a great replacement for coal. Um, the the idea here is that one of the challenges with with today's technology, or, or I guess the historical technology that we're using today for nuclear, is that uh, because the uh, safety concerns over uh, nuclear accidents. There's there's a lot of complexity and cost that goes into reactor design, you know. So you have to make sure that there's feed water uh, flow at all times, even if there's loss of offsite power. And so then you have uh, diesel generators to make sure that those pumps are working, and then you have to have backup systems, and and those systems need backup systems. And so by the time you have all these layers of of complexity and safety systems, uh, nuclear um, power plants are extremely expensive to to, to build, and license, and operate. And so the next generation in design is what they call small modular reactors, where they have a smaller core that generates the heat for the, the nuclear reaction that, that you'll get the steam from to turn the turbine. Um, but each module of these reactor cores is small enough where if it if it has a catastrophic uh, failure, uh, it just the amount of decay decay heat in that core isn't enough to melt the containment vessel that it's contained in. So there's no possibility of a of a meltdown, you know, fuel release scenario like like you know we've had with Three Mile Island or Chernobyl or Fukushima or those types of things. So um, so it's much more inherently safe. And so the idea here is that if 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 you can kind of re remove the complexity and the cost you can have a cost competitive generation solution. That's the goal. And so the, the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy is, is funding the development of uh, prototype demonstration projects. And once those are proven out, I think it could be a very viable uh, option for the future. So as you can tell, I'm very optimistic that, that I think that's a great technology, but there's a long ways to go to prove it out. Uh, we thought nuclear power, for, you know, if you look back in time, we thought it was going to be too cheap to meter because, you know, hey, there's no fuel. You just put a, some fuel rods in here and bang, you get all this energy out. It's going to be great. And and they kind of underestimated the, the cost of, of really operating, and you know, building and operating and, and all the things that go with that. Um, so hopefully uh, small modular reactor technology design will be great and we'll be able to use it as a dispatchable firm resource in the future. But the 
you know, that's not proven yet. So so we'll have to see how that goes. And this will take time. Um, I don't expect to this to change the, the energy picture in the next 10 years. Um, so even if everything goes great and uh, there's no surprises in the in the technology development process, it, it'll stay, still take 10 to 15 years before it's widespread adopted. And then, of course, if they come across problems and issues or if it's more complicated or expensive than they thought it was going to be, then, it, then it'll fizzle out. So that that's my kind of view on the reactor nuclear future. Yeah, and I think Jeff's talked, uh, done a really good job with this. It The nuclear, the small nuclear will change the paradigm around nuclear. Traditionally, nuclear is the base and then everything else goes around it. As we talk about the small nuclear reactors, there's talk of them being able to ramp up and ramp down, provide services, um, also possibly to produce hydrogen, um, at, at, to produce hydrogen that could be used um, and other e-hydrogen that could be used. So, um, and there are two very large DOD or DOE grants in the Tri-Cities area. So the state of Washington is actually um, uh, leading a lot of these efforts in the small small nuclear uh, reactors. So, well, I think we've run out of time. So um, if there are additional questions, uh, you can feel free to reach out to one of the four of us. But um, thank you so much for the great questions and discussions. And um, we will, or we are hoping by early in the new year to have kind of a report that summarizes some of this and also to look at what are some of our next steps are, particularly as we talk with our uh, Advanced Grid Institute Industrial Advisory Board, we'll be looking at some of those different activities. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your week. Uh, be safe across the state of Washington with our our winter weather this week. Thanks. Thanks. So Thank let, you. Let, let, let me let me say yes something. That I I I. You're muted, on John. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going on with the students here. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Thanks. So the the thank you the reason.